bond energies and bond lengths. Um, in a previous chapter, whose number I can't remember, we talked about enthalpy changes, enthalpy of reaction, um, and how we can calculate that. We can also use individual bond energies to estimate enthalpy changes in reactions. What we call the bond energy is the energy required to break one mole of that particular bond in the gas phase. And bond energies are always positive. It always requires energy to break bonds. And so again, you know, these, these positive negative signs can be confusing. So we're putting ourselves in the position of the molecule and in order for my bond to be broken, you have to give me energy to break my bond. You have to pay me money to, to break this thing of mine. So it's a positive energy. So the, the stronger the bond, the more energy it takes to break. And they're, just, they're measured in the gas phase just to be standard and convenient. So HCl, binary molecule, contains one bond between hydrogen and chlorine. If you break that bond, you end up with hydrogen atoms, chlorine atoms, and that's 431 kilojoules to break one mole of that bond. If a compound has very strong bonds, it tends to be more stable and less reactive. If the bonds are very weak, it will tend to be more reactive. When molecules react, existing bonds have to be broken and new bonds are formed. So bond energies can be measured in specific compounds, and they will vary slightly from compound to compound. Um, so what we use is an average bond energy. So if we're looking here um, at a carbon-hydrogen bond, if it's in methane, the bond energy is 438 kilojoules. If it's in trifluoromethane, the bond energy is 446. If we change fluorine to bromine, we've got 402. I'm sorry, these are kilojoules. And trichloromethane is 401 kilojoules. So the energy of the carbon-hydrogen bond is going to vary a little depending on what compound it's in. But just to make things a little easier, we often use average bond energies. So are we going to exactly calculate the enthalpy of reaction? No, but we're going to get an estimate. Double and triple bonds, double bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds because more electrons are being shared and it pulls those nuclei together. Triple bonds are even shorter and stronger than double bonds and so they have bi higher bond energies. So there are tables. There, um, this is one table, I think there's more in the back of the book and the CRC has pages and pages of average bond energies. And of course you could look these up on the internet too. So the average energy of a hydrogen-hydrogen bond is 436 kilojoules. Um, a carbon-carbon triple bond is 837. And so these are all kilojoules per mole of bonds. So we can use bond energies to estimate enthalpy changes for reactions. And what we do is we imagine that we're breaking the bonds in the reactants and we figure out how much energy would it take to completely take apart these Lego structures and then we're going to put them back together and when you make a bond you get the energy back. Okay, So if you break a bond and it's 436 kilojoules when that bond is formed it releases 436 kilojoules of energy. So we take for a heat of reaction, this is an estimate the change in enthalpy for breaking all the bonds and for making the new bonds. Okay, so these are going to be negative because the bonds are being formed. These are going to be positive. So, as an example, where are we starting here? So this is a reaction of 
methane, and chlorine. And to estimate the enthalpy of the reaction, we're going to look at what's happening with the bonds. This is what we're producing, chloromethane and hydrogen chloride. So in this process, the chlorine-chlorine bond was broken, and one of the carbon-hydrogen bonds was broken. So we look up the energy for carbon-hydrogen bonds and chlorine-chlorine bonds, and that, that's a positive here to break those bonds. And then we're looking at the bonds that are being formed. Well, we're making a chlorine-carbon bond, and we're making a hydrogen-chlorine bond. And those are going to be negative. And then we add them together, and the difference is the heat of reaction. Does that make any sense? So I've said, I've talked to you before about potential energy, and I've said that the energy is stored in chemical bonds. Well, what happens when you break a chemical bond, that requires energy. So how is energy stored in chemical bonds? <coughs> what happens when you have an energy-rich compound that has a lot of potential chemical energy? When it undergoes reaction, you have weak bonds being broken and stronger bonds being formed. And so the net difference is that energy is released. It's really the forming of the new chemical bonds that releases the energy. It always requires energy to break bonds. So let's look at this. A potential future fuel is methanol. Write a balanced equation for the combustion of gaseous methanol and use bond energies to calculate the enthalpy of the combustion of methanol in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so methanol, CH3OH, when that burns, it's going to react with what? Oxygen, and it's going to form what? CO2 and water. Is that balanced? white. There's one carbon on the left, one carbon on the right. Three oxygens on the left, three oxygens on the right, but there's four hydrogens on the left and only two hydrogens on the right. So you need to put a two here to fix the hydrogens, which messes up the oxygens. So now um, we have two plus two. We have four on the right and we have three on the left. Um, we really don't want to mess around with that because then we're going to have to go around the whole circle again. Um, this only comes in pairs, so this is what I've called the odd-even problem. We need to add one, but we can only add pairs. So the solution to the odd-even problem is just double everything. So I'm going to change that two into a four. I'm going to put a two here. I'm going to put a two here. This is the one I'm messing around with, so I'm going to leave that alone right now. By doubling everything but the oxygen, the carbons and the hydrogens are still balanced, right? And so I have not compounded my problem. I still am just dealing with oxygen. So now on the right side, I have 2 times 2 is 4 plus 4, 8 oxygens. Now I need to get eight oxygens over here. I have two there, so I need six from this. So there's our balanced equation. Now we're supposed to use bond energies to calculate the enthalpy of combustion. I need to get my textbook out here because bond energies are not something that anybody memorizes. Standard thermodynamic quantities. Where's my table of bond energies? Maybe.
maybe it's not back here. Okay, I guess it's just in the chapter. It's just that one table. So we're in chapter 9. I should have paused, but it's too late. So I'll just keep talking so they don't think I went away. Bond energies, okay. So I got my table of bond energies. Table 9.4 in that edition anyway. So what we need to do is we need to look at this and figure out what bonds are being broken and what bonds are being formed. Well here we have O2 and so those bonds are going to have to be broken, right? So we've got oxygen, oxygen bonds being broken. Um, it can be helpful. Question? Well, I'll show you. That's a good question. Why do we have to break that? There's O2 over here. Can't we just form a carbon oxygen bond? You kind of, there's a reason we're doing this after Lewis structures. Um, so let's think about carbon monoxide, I'm sorry, carbon dioxide. We actually need to know the Lewis structure for it. Sorry, it's, it's just true. Because um, we have to know what's being broken and what's being formed. There's the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. So we're going to be forming two carbon-oxygen double bonds for each molecule. There's two molecules here, so four, right? Four, bleh. Four carbon-oxygen double bonds are being formed. When we're making this, we're forming a carbon-oxygen double bond here and here for one molecule. The coefficient says we have two of them. So that's why I have four of these bonds. So over here with the oxygen, in O2, is that a single bond or a double bond? Does it matter? It matters because double and triple bonds are stronger than single bonds. In oxygen, we have double bond. So if we're taking this apart, we've got double bonds, and how many of them are getting broken? Three. Which one do you want to tackle next? The big one. Okay, let's do the big one. Okay, so here we've got methanol. So let's sketch out methanol. So there's methanol. Now, there are some shortcuts you can take. Um, let's also just throw water in over here. Again, you know, I often think of atoms and molecules as Legos and Lego structures. Um, Water has two hydrogen-oxygen bonds, and this guy over here has a hydrogen-oxygen bond. And so do I have to take all of those apart? No. Could I? I could. Would it make any difference? It would not. They would cancel each other out. So this is where it kind of depends on your level of understanding and how things make sense to you. For some people, it's easier to say, you know what, I don't want to keep track of stuff. I'm just going to say, let's break all the bonds and remake all the bonds, and that's simpler for me to deal with. Other people are, are seeing stuff, and they're like, oh, but we don't have to count those because they're over here, and that's great. Okay, so I'm not going to talk to you people because you're the ones that are going to be able to figure it out just fine on your own. So we're going to take the more straightforward and tedious approach. Those often go hand in hand. We're just going to break everything. 
we're going to take it down to individual atoms, individual Lego bricks, and then we're going to put them all back together. Instead of saying, oh, but we could take half of this spaceship and just stuck these things on it and transform it into something else. I have some kids who have Lego brains like that, and they just, I'm like, how did you do that? Give me the instructions, I can follow that, but don't make me make anything up. So we're just going to take this guy completely apart. Okay, so what kind of bonds do we have in here? How many carbon-hydrogen bonds do we have? There's three carbon-hydrogen bonds, and this says we've got two of these groups. So that's six, right? So for this guy, we've got six carbon-hydrogen bonds that we're breaking. What else are we breaking? Carbon-oxygen bond. There's one in each molecule, but we have two molecules. And what else? The oxygen-hydrogen bond. How many? Two. For this amount. Because that's how we're going to end up with per mole. And we've got these guys being broken, and these guys being formed. And then in the water, we've got two hydrogen-oxygen bonds for each, and there's four. So that's eight hydrogen-oxygen bonds. Now, a hydrogen-oxygen bond is the same as an oxygen-hydrogen bond. So I'm going to rewrite that just so it looks the same. Any questions yet? You can't just look at the formulas. You have to think about the Lewis structures at the very least. So now we're going to do some adding up. So we're going to look up carbon-hydrogen bond. 100 and, no, those are bond lengths. It's not table 9.4. Where did it go? Table 9.3. Okay. Uh, Carbon-hydrogen bond is 414. So each of those is 414. And carbon... Pardon me? Kilojoules. Kilojoules per mole. Um, Carbon-oxygen bond is 360. Oxygen-hydrogen is 464. Oxygen, oxygen, double bond, 498. It's like looking up prices. <coughs> and then over here, a carbon oxygen double bond is 736, um, except in CO2, it says. It's 7.99 in CO2. There's a little asterisk. 7.99 in CO2, and we do have CO2 here, so 7.99. And oxygen, hydrogen, we already looked up was 4.64. Bonds that are being broken are positive numbers. Bonds that are being formed are negative numbers. So I wrote the positive numbers in black and the negative numbers in red. We're going to add these up now. And, and stuff like this is one of the reasons that in elementary school, your math teacher was on you to show your work, right? This stuff is hard to do all in your head. It's complicated. If I didn't write these things down, I would probably not get the right answer. I may still not get the right answer, but I have a better shot at it now. So six of these bonds are broken. So I'm going to take six times the 414. And there were two carbon-oxygen bonds. Two times 360. And there were two oxygen-hydrogen bonds, 2 times 464. And there were three 
of the oxygen-oxygen double bonds, 498. Those are all positive numbers. Bonds being broken. And then I'm going to add up the negative ones. So I've got four of those bonds being formed. That releases energy. And I've got eight of these being formed. That releases energy. Any questions? No, I need my calculator. Let's see here. Six times four fourteen plus two times three sixty plus two times four sixty four plus three times four ninety eight plus four times <coughs> negative seven ninety nine plus eight times negative four sixty four equals. So my calculator is showing me two four two nine point nine eight. And that is going to be kilojoules per mole. We really should report that with probably three significant figures. And so we would say 2.43 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole. Any questions? It's a little bit like going to the store and you're going to buy these things and you're going to return these things. And what's, what's it come out to? Right. So just be careful with your negative signs. Average bond length is the average length of a bond between two particular atoms. Again, in a large number of different compounds, because the specific bond length will vary, just like the energy does from compound to compound. Generally speaking, double bonds are shorter than single, triple are shorter than double. So if we look at the carbon bonds, we see a carbon-carbon single bond is 154 picometers. The double is 134. The triple is 120. They get shorter, and the bond strength gets greater. Longer bonds usually are weaker. And if we think about Coulomb's law, the distance between the charged objects affects the strength of attraction, so that makes, a sen makes sense. There are exceptions to that. Um, these are average bond lengths, and this was table 9.4 I was inadvertently referring to. And we, we just tell you about that, and then we don't really do anything with it. That's okay. <laughs>